Good evening. If you can see me, if you can see us, that really, really, really can really mean one thing. It means is Mental Health Monday. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Mental Health Monday brought to you by Saving Grace Community Church and Grace House Cincinnati, a ministry and nonprofit agency of Saving Grace Community Church. I'm Pastor Trevor Phillips, along with my co-host, cohort and road dog, Dr. Quentin Moss, Chief Medical Director and Founder and CEO of Modern Psychiatry. Good evening, my friend. Good evening, brother. Good to be here tonight. It's good to be here, and it's great to be here in the shortest month uh, of the year as we celebrate uh, African American or Black or Afro, <laughs> depending upon the era, a history month. Tonight, we're excited, uh, Dr. Moss, as we engage um, some young men, as we talk about, uh, deal from the topic, young, Black, and male. Uh, it's been a long time since I was young and uh, not as long uh, for you, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but both of us can just relate to the struggles. Uh, we can relate to the challenges that we've had growing up, um, not only black, but growing up as a black male uh, in America. And I would assume for you, uh, uh, Dr. Moss, you may have had even some more challenges growing up in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, Virginia was a little different. You know, we've had um, you know challenges in the past with law enforcement. We saw that in Virginia Beach. We saw that in Norfolk at times, uh, particularly when I was in college. Yeah, so it was a, it's a bit challenging, you know, for for that case. Uh, nice well, things have changed for us in our country. Some, someone has, has aptly said that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, and certainly there's some uh, statistics that bear that in mind. Uh, when we think about being an African-American male, it's perhaps one of the most challenging demographics uh, to be a part of in our, our country. Uh, back in 2020, um, there was a conference titled Breaking the Cycle, Overcoming the Challenges Faced by Black Boys and Men. And the event was sponsored by the Center on Children and Families and Race, Prosperity and Inclusion Initiative. And there were some statistics some some information, some data uh, shared in that event that, that are very, very eye-opening. 32% um, uh, Black males account for 32% of the prison population but only account for 6% of the overall U.S. population. Uh, black males are five times more likely to be incarcerated during their lifetime than white men, and they are more likely to serve longer sentences than white men on the average of 19% or longer. And as compared to black women, white men and white women, black men have lower levels of educational attainment, uh, according to the data put out uh, through the Brookings Institute, which was a source of information for that conference. We've been labeled everything as black males. One thing that we've been labeled um, is uh, we considered by many to be an endangered species. And it's been said that many studies have been done on us. Uh, many conversations have had been had about us. Uh, but really uh, tonight, uh, as we look in and try to understand those that fit within the statistic or the demographic being young, black and male, we are happy to have tonight uh, with us uh, three young men 
who will be able to help us uh, in our discussion uh, tonight. And as I share with them, hopefully they'll lead in the discussion. You and I will just kind of jump in when we can. The first uh, guest tonight we would like to welcome is Lawrence uh, Kane. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Hey, thank you for having me, Pastor. Lawrence Kane is uh, lives here in Cincinnati uh, and is a proprietary owner of Abundance University. Secondly, we like to welcome to the show a native of Cincinnati, uh, Tyreek Wilson Esquire. Um, a lives in Chicago, Illinois, at the and serves and works there. Welcome to the show, Tyreek. Yep, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And lastly, our friend on the left coast, Brother Keandre, Brother Keandre, who works uh, with the Tesla company. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Mr. Phillips. So on tonight, uh, our title uh, discussion is Young, Black, and Male. Uh, when you hear that, what is your immediate reaction about being young, black, and male, uh, Lawrence? Um, I think for me, it means uh, privilege. Like it's a it's an honor to be young, black, and 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 a, and a man. Uh, we get we get the opportunity to change some narratives. Uh, we get the opportunity to um, hold on to some you know good traditions in our culture, as well as reimagine uh, how we become better fathers, better husbands. Um, and better pillars in the community. So that, that's that's how I've approached uh, this uh, time of my life. And uh, Tyreek? Yeah, so I will piggyback on what Lawrence said, privilege. I think being a young black male um, is one of the coolest things you can be in the world. Everybody wants to be us, uh, but also say responsibility because oftentimes we find ourselves as the only one that looks like us in the spaces we're in. So. You have a responsibility to represent yourself, um, your people, your family, and your brand. Love it. Love it. And Keandre? I definitely have to echo what Tyreek said and say that in addition to feeling privileged to be a young Black man in America, you have to understand that because there's not a lot of people that look like you in your respective field or industries, often at times, that it's a reminder that despite all of the advances our culture has made over the past centuries in America, that we still have a long way to go. And we still have a long way that we can be and become with, you know, all the amenities and luxuries that we have today and privileges that we have today. So an opportunity. Well, working for the Tesla company, um, it, how many, um, what percentage of your company would you say that folk look like you? That's that's a hard question to answer. I'm not going to lie. Um, to be honest, within my department specifically, there's a handful when I first started two years ago at the company. However, it has been promising to see over the last two, two years alone, an increasing amount of African-Americans join the company. And I've actually had started a group, uh, a group messaging chat between us because I understand what it can feel like to be the only one of your color and that type of environment. So it's been lacking, but it's been growing. Well, you work in industry, you, you, you work uh, uh, in, in, in business. Uh, uh, what does it, why do you think uh, there are not more folks working in your business, your area, your, your field? Honestly, that's a multi, multi, a question with a multifaceted answer. But really, when it comes down to it, it's about representation. Mm -hmm. In my, in my head, I think it's when I growing up back in Cincinnati in high school, I felt like I had a lot of role models and mentors in certain areas, certain fields. In the media, it was easy to see kind of, you know, what it meant to be a, black, a successful black man in America. Whereas in certain industries, especially the tech industry, there's not as much represent, representation as there could be. And oftentimes, some of my coworkers I see that come from different demographics. The reason why there's as large of a representation is because they have mentors, they have their parents, they have friends, they have, you know, coworkers, alumni that have all been in that industry and recommend them, recommend them to join it. So. The more of us that go into uh, industries in which we're underrepresented, the more chances and opportunities we'll have to increase that representation. So uh, for those who may say it's a question of uh, aptitude and not opportunity, how would you respond? 
I would respond that again, that's a black or white question that doesn't necessarily capture all the nuances of what goes into the process of hiring people. So for instance, it still remains to this day that a lot of recruiters at these large companies have inherent biases that they're not cognizant of when they're hiring. It's easy to be dismissive of someone's experience and how it could set them up for success in a particular role if you don't come from someone with a similar background or similar experience. And so although aptitude definitely plays a factor, there's other numerous factors as, as well that play into a person's ability to join these types of industries and roles. Tyreek, you are uh, particularly, you're in one of those fields that if you're sitting in front of a room full of kids and you say, what would you like to be when you grow up? Uh, many might say these days a professional athlete, but there may be a few to say that I want to be a doctor and I want to be a lawyer. When you think about um, the law and the relationship that the law has with persons uh, in within your demographic group, um, how does that help motivate you uh, to continue in your career in law? And tell tell us, let's share with us what what was the major motivation for you to even uh, go to law school and become a lawyer? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. Um, something Keandre said, um, sort of hinting at exposure, right? kids seeing people that look like them do certain jobs. And as a kid, I had a doctor uh, from the time I was born, African-American, Dr. Bradley Jackson. And so just seeing him, you know, he was a, he was relatively young, um, smart, but you know, he showed that, you know, being a doctor could be a cool thing. Right. And mm -hmm. just seeing that from the, from the early ages motivated me to want to be something. Um, and started off as a doctor, kind of realized science wasn't my thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I saw that all the opportunities and the options that a law degree could, could open for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I primarily practice in, on the business side of the law, mm -hmm. which is where I want to be. I like business, but I like the law as well. And I think that knowing that the law just impacts our lives in so many ways on a daily basis and that we are underrepresented, that's what makes me go to work every day. You know, I worked at a law firm for the past two and a half years, but I didn't really see myself um, having an impact in the way that I wanted to. I helped a lot of businesses conduct their operations and keep the ball moving that way. But I recently just got involved with the local church up here. They started a counseling and justice center. So I'm starting to branch out more, you know, I have my job, obviously I have to pay the bills, but I want to have a bigger impact on the community and I, I'm figuring out ways to do that. Well, you know, I love to hear that. The fact that you see how you connect to kingdom work in terms of what you do, and you in your work in the community, I think that that that's awesome. Uh, when you think about the legal system in the law, um, do you believe that the law is um, set up for a black man, a black male, particularly in your age group, to succeed, or you think that um, there are some definite uh, pitfalls that one might fall in uh, just by being black and male? Um, we can travel to Minnesota. We can travel down to Georgia. We can travel even up northeastern Ohio. We can go into boardrooms. We can go into break rooms where we are underrepresented. And oftentimes we have to simulate. And I used to tell kids that uh, when we I worked years ago helping kids get internships and in businesses, I say, you know, you've got to be like bilingual. You got to understand how to talk within the confines of the, of the, of the organizational culture. And then if you want to use your Ebonics and just want to kick it, that's a time off into itself. But when you find yourself in that space, unfortunately, uh, you if, if that environment is not accepting you know, uh, that environment, you might have to put that on hold. So respond to that. Yeah, I, uh, I think that there are certain areas of the law that are absolutely discriminatory on their face right so there are sentencing rules you know the difference is you know how crack is punished versus cocaine but by and large i think that the law is set up in a fair way you know i think that it's written to be neutral and impartial but i think you have bad actors who sort of enforce it the wrong way and that get kind of gets at the importance of judges i think that judges are extremely important people in the legal system and two judges can read the same set of facts and have two different outcomes and biases come into play there. So I think that the law itself as written is is fair, but I think that we have bad actors in the system um, 
And that's why folks like me in our generation, you know, we, we have to increase our representation because we have more opportunities than, than past generations. So we can mm -hmm. take advantage of that and sort of rid the system of the bad actors. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Lawrence, they say the information is power. And I was in, I was involved in a conversation with Dr. Moss and part of our little, a little monthly powwow. And we were just talking about how, if you don't have exposure to certain things, if you don't have knowledge uh, of, of certain things, you don't know how to matriculate into society and become successful and to thrive and survive. You are the proprietary owner of Abundance University. Uh, tell us a little bit about that financial literacy company and, and why finance is, is, is so important and, and where you see the, the inequities uh, and the disparities uh, in terms of just uh, African-Americans knowledge of finances. Sure. So, I mean, I started Abundance University um, in 2015, and the real <laughs> the real reason why I started it was because I was working in corporate America and the company I worked for, I wasn't satisfied in my role. So I actually was giving them suggestions on what we can do to make more impact uh, in our for our company, as far as our clients that we serve. And they shot me down. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm not going to wait for you to create a role in which I can thrive in. I can just create my own company. So I was I started Abundance University while working full time. And essentially all we focus on is financial education. And that looks different depending on if we're talking to a third grader or we're talking to a 65 year old who's trying to retire. Um, so we serve that <laughs> that range um, through different programming. We do one on one financial coaching. Uh, we sp do workshops for, you know, again, elementaries, middle school, high school, colleges. Um, I've written three books since 2017. And going into the second phase of your question, it it's it's really about the. The exposure to execution when it comes to our finances, right? So we know how to make money, but how do we ex really execute on making sure we um, are earning the right amount? Are we managing it properly? Are we investing it properly? Are we building healthy relationships, both personally and professionally, that will help our finances um, stay intact, right? Um, are we good at goal setting? And not just saying that we want to make more money, but actually having a dollar amount, actually having a, a, a plan of attack when it comes to the goals. And then overall, the right mindset, right? So before you can change your situation, you have to change your mindset about your situation. Like, I don't I don't have to work. I get to work. Mm -hmm. Like, just small things like that. I'm not, I don't say I'm broke, mm -hmm. right? I say I'm sowing seeds. And that looks different because everybody has seeds that they can sow when it comes to their financial journey. Like you're not lacking seeds. You're you're just you're just lacking the time it takes for those seeds to you're lacking patience at this point. Uh, but then also on the on the other end, when it comes to the disparities in our community, again, it's the resources. It's the you know, our schools don't have financial literacy as a staple. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we're here in Cincinnati. You know, Cincinnati Public Schools is a district that I work for and they mm -hmm. pride themselves on the three E's, getting them get getting the kids, you know, employed, enrolled or enlisted after mm -hmm. graduation. But we have to focus on the economical piece to that. No matter what you do after high school, finances is something that is going to be a part of your life, whether mm -hmm. you learned it or not. So why not teach that every to every single student that comes to our doors? Um, and again, that's a big push for 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 Abundance University. We work with schools. Again, we 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 teach them the pillars of Abundance University. We also are giving them the strategies, right? Because that's another thing. I can give you information. I can go to Google and type in how to budget, but I'm giving you the strategy on how to implement it. I'm giving you the resources in which you can use so that five, 10 years.
years from now, you're getting that conversation on how to truly create generational happiness, not generational wealth. Well, you and you said something that's very key. You said patience, because we live in a time where, as we said, Dr. Miles, this is microwave uh, time now. It's microwave time. We, 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 this is the day of instant gratification. And so to the point now where you have people uh, who are calling uh, rent your own type uh, businesses where you are renting a television for X amount of dollars. And then over the life of renting that, you will pay three times the original cost if you had budgeted or put money aside to get that. And so the question I, I, I have for you is uh, what is the strategy or can be a strategy for getting, uh, particularly though the pe persons of brown and black community to understand that uh, investment, that um, putting something off may produce uh, better uh, yields later on yeah i mean it's just it goes back to the parable of the talents right mm -hmm. like you literally have these gifts and these skills and even uh your money um and mm -hmm. it's it's you you want to position yourself to where you're making it work for you as opposed to you working for it mm -hmm. um that's number one number two when it comes to a specific strategy you know if you can't buy it twice then you shouldn't buy it at all um, that can be one thing that you can implement, right? These different, um, again, the mindset. Um, also, understanding that what you are after in five years uh, will come if you focus on what you're doing in the next five hours. So you got to think short term and long term when it comes to those things. Yeah, we might, you know, I'm addicted to shoes, right? But I'm not going to spend my last dollar on some shoes. Like I got, I got enough already, you know? So, you know, those, those rent to own places, you know, the errands of the world, the, um, you know, even this, the online one that a lot of people don't talk about, like Klarna and Afterpay. Those are like, <laughs> people have five or six different Afterpays for shoes and things that they don't even technically need. So maybe just, you know, we're in February. Maybe you go the next three months with only buying needs and see how much money you actually save. And then you could get that TV. You could get, you know, those new pairs of shoes. You could, you know, have a down payment on a vacation that you're after. So it's just a matter of, again, thinking forward, but then working now to, you know, get to that point. That's an excellent point. Dr. Moss, uh, stats released back in 2017 show that 26% of black households lived in high poverty neighborhoods as compared to just 5% of white uh, household. And high poverty neighborhoods, uh, of course, are, are characterized um, poor quality schools, less access to jobs, high rates of crime, pollution, congestion, and, and all of those things. But they're also uh, a characteristic of an oppressed people. I think it was Albert Einstein who said uh, the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. And so uh, for the mindset, uh, the Bible says, uh, as a man thinks, so is he. The mindset, the mindset, the mindset, the mindset uh, from a psychological uh, view, what can we do to help with the mindset being changed from one that uh, allows itself to live in a label rather than to live in a live in hope and live in a dream. You know, we have to speak to what we want to become. You know, we can speak to some of the, uh, the challenges in our community that you just mentioned. And I like that, you know, as we're talking here, we're talking about the, the privilege and the opportunity of being a black man. But, you know, one gentleman said, but we have so much opportunity in front of us. So we have to speak to what we want to become. That, that's part of it. And, you know, I believe that the nucleus of the family helps create them. So we can't sometimes change the dynamics that are around us. We can't change policing or we can't change how much money we make for our neighborhood. But we can change what we say in our homes, what we teach our kids, what kind of direction we give, that verbiage. And you know, that's part of what we can do. You know, living in poverty as a black man, it's 
talk about health. You know, there's a reason why our life expectancy is less than uh, you know, our white counterpart. There's a reason why we have a you know, greater risk of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Some of that is surrounding behavior, but some of that is just the outcome of what oppression does to our body. So it's likely we have to be, you know, very aware of that and try to do countermeasures to make sure that we can keep ourselves healthy in light of this oppression. So that means that those things that are detriments to us, we have to minimize, whether it's alcohol or any drugs. You know, any drama that we got in our lives, we got we got to try to minimize that. You know, creating how dual households, we got to minimize that. We talk about trying to make sure we regulate what we eat, what we take in, making sure that we do a preventive medicine. You know, as men, we, we have to do that. So the brother was talking about how we have to invest in our future with our, with our money to try to make sure that we reach these milestones. Very important. But now that I'm 48, I'm thinking, I need to invest in my health. So when I get 55 and 60, I can have the health that goes along with the wealth that I'm doing. And so what's the, you know, if you need to build this wealth, if I don't have the health to enjoy it, or I don't have the lifespan to realize what to be able to appreciate it. So that's a, another part of that. And, you know, I can go on and on and talk about this issue of health, but one of my frat brothers, you know, Aubrey says that, you know, um, health is wealth. And it's true, because if we're able to take care of our minds and our bodies now, it's less of the future we're going to mm-hmm. have to get over. It's hopefully better premiums than our, than our insurance. There's less time in the hospital, less medications we have to take. You know, all of these things you know, create expense, and if we're sicker, our earning potential becomes less. So these things are intertwined. Well, does affect health. Um, and then we have to make sure that we have the health that we need so that we can enjoy the wealth. Keandre, uh, you live in San Francisco. Uh, like uh, Tyreek, like Lawrence, you grew up in Cincinnati. Um, how accepting uh, is the culture in, or how kind is the culture uh, environment to African American males in San Francisco? And how does that compare to uh, in this region, in the Midwest? That's an interesting question. Uh, I, the perspective I'm answering this question from right now is coming from a weekend in which I was just in New York, uh, in Brooklyn specifically, where there's a bunch of us. Uh, representation is off the charts. And coming back into San Francisco, while it is diverse in a multitude of ways, Black representation is not one of those ways, necessarily mm-hmm. speaking. However, the way I go about it is, even though there may not be that many of me particularly in San Francisco as I find my community through work and also from going to other cities in the area, such as Oakland, which there's a higher proportion of Black representation. Uh, Ultimately, though, my experience thus far has been that it's friendly. But again, the fewer of us you have in a particular area, the fewer or more comfortable and open, I would say, people are up to, you know, reaching out to you or making that first step. Sometimes it has to be you that makes that first step. And if I may, I just really want to take the opportunity to kind of kind of piggyback and answer one of the questions you asked earlier regarding this entire culture these days of instant gratification and, you know, the significance of investing. Honestly, the culture of instant gratification has just underscored and emphasized how important it is to embody a mindset of delayed gratification. And not only with finances, because as we've, as all of us are, I'm sure, are aware of investing, it takes an extreme mindset of delayed Mm -hmm. gratification to put away money that you may not touch for a year, five years, 10 years, 20, 40 years to ensure that you're set up successfully to retire comfortably. And that delayed gratification concept extends to not only finances, but also health. When it comes to dieting and fitness, when you're working out, you're not going to see results instantaneously. You need to be putting in the work consistently day after day. And the same concept applies to you know your health when it comes to what you eat and education, when it comes to you know starting college or starting you know, to learn whatever new skill it may be. So I just had to kind of chime in there. Oh, and yeah. Echo the comments of Lawrence and yourself early on that as well. Tyreek, I want to ask you a question. Uh, gr- growing up in Cincinnati and now in Chicago, um, how much uh, of a re- do you take it on as a responsibility if you are the only person that looks like you in a space? 
to be the one to set the record straight about what a black male is and what an African American is. I, I can just go back back in the day to to college, going to Ohio University, and being on campus with some people who had never been around black folk before, and they wanted to touch my hair when I had it. They wanted to see what it is we would put it on. They 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 were they were just uh, just just amazed about you know uh, you know some of them wanted to follow us in the shower. You know, they, they had all of these ideas about blacks and what we were all about. So how much of do you find it a responsibility uh, when you're in a space where it's just you to kind of represent and educate? Yeah, I, uh, I take it very seriously. You know, um, Chicago is, is, is a great city full of opportunities, very diverse. I love it here. Right. It's coastal home. It's a happy medium from it, for any kid, for any person from the Midwest. But it's also a tale of two cities in a lot of ways. You know, the Chirac, that's not just a myth. That's not hype. That's real. You know, it it really is, you know, very nice. And the Gold Coast and by the river, it's all nice. But then you have the South Side and the West Side where there are greater disparities. So I think that um, even though there are a lot of Blacks here, there are, may not be a lot of Blacks, you know, that are in the C-suite, so to say. Um, so I... I you know, being here, I always try to put my best foot forward to represent myself and our community because there aren't a lot of, there aren't many, there are a lot of bad examples here. I'll say that. There are a lot of bad examples here. And I take it seriously that I can set the record straight one person at a time. You know, you can't change an entire, um, an entire community by yourself, but you can change one person's interaction and that person can, you know, hey, uh, that's not true, you know, uh, and, and try to dispel myths at a personal micro level. Um, so that that's that's what I would say. Uh, Chicago is a great city, diverse, but there's a lot of things here that need to be fixed. And if I can do that one interaction at a time, I try to do that. How comfortable in, in Chicago do you feel in your skin? Very comfortable. Again, you mm -hmm. know, I see people like me all the time, um, but it's just a tale of two cities in a lot of ways. So whenever I can make a positive example, I try to do that. Lawrence, uh, everyone here, uh, uh, Keandre and Tyreek are, are not married. Uh, you're the only guy beside uh, Dr. Marlis and I who, who is married. Uh, how, what do you think the view uh, about marriage uh, that, that you know, young black males have? What do you think their view is about that? And I want to swing back to uh, Keandre and uh, Sorry to, to chime in. Um, I think it depends on what social media platform you're on, honestly. Okay. Um, yeah. you know, a lot a lot of people my age, um, again, being 33, I, I've been married since I was 25. So, you know, been off the market for a while, you know, considering mm -hmm. my age. And you know, a lot of my friends are married, a lot, you know, and and and, and loving marriages you know where you know our it, any relationship is hard whether it's a business relationship relationship with your siblings relationship with your parents relationship with your spouse um but it's all about again the seeds that you sow into it um that that makes it you know worth it and and you know i can i can you know live at you know i can go to sleep at night knowing that i've sowed seeds into my marriage just as i did as my business um, but I, I really believe that a lot of black men uh, would love to be married. Um, but but you also got to think of people's upbringing. Everybody didn't uh, get exposed to what true, you know, <laughs> marriage and companionship uh, is, you know, whether it was, um, you know, in your household that you didn't see it or even a lot of our movies, you know, a lot of movies that we mm -hmm. grew up, you know, loving and you know you think of the boys of the hood the south centrals the mm -hmm. um you know even the parody ones like don't be a menace like right. there's really not a a lot of representation um even with our you know but then you got the sitcoms like fresh prince where you saw uncle phil he, he felt like our uncle and he had a loving relationship with Aunt viv um you know you you kind of you know as you grow up you 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 either um you paint a picture right like you you see pictures and then you paint your own based on those images based on what you've seen and i think that for the majority of black men 
Um, they're hopeful and they, they definitely want to be in a relationship, a long lasting one. Um, but it's all about uh, honestly getting out of your own way. And, and, and actually, I mean, I, I don't know if you all can see it, but I mean, I have my Invest in Black Women uh, shirt on. I mean, that's part of our brand. We sell these. And it's just, you know, again, being like, there's nothing like loving a Black woman, in my opinion. So um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm more than confident that, you know, our young Black men are uh, going to do a great job at, again, breaking those generational curses of single parent households and you know the, the the men going to jail for a long period of time is is you know we're we're changing those narratives for sure. I think it's a combination. I often say that sometimes it's no so much it's not so much as there being a generational curse as so much as there being generational ignorance. And I believe that because of a lack of disinformation, um, people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Mm. And I think information is power. Um, but one of the narratives. Uh, about African American men is that um, we we can't commit or we don't have uh, the ability, uh, and we would just rather just be studs uh, and until we retire out into the pasture. Um, Tyreek being single in uh, the Midwest and um, having grown up in a two parent household. Um, what do you have you come to understand uh, personally in your conversations with persons, uh, your, your friends that may be single? What is their take on marriage? Yeah, I, I think uh, it won't want to a lot of key points. And, you know, uh, I think that it is something that my friends value. You know, it's something that I want. Um, I think that companionship is important. You know, behind every strong man is, is a good woman. Right. I, I truly believe that. I don't think that's just you know, some cliche saying that's out there. I think that's real. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that especially if you're an ambitious person who's trying to accomplish a lot, having somebody there who has your best interest, who, you know, who has your back, who is a confidant, I don't think you, I think that's like invaluable, right? Um, so I think that that's what I'm working for. Um, Happy Lawrence found that. And I think that's true for my friend group too. Um, and, and I will echo the, the, black, the black woman sentiment. sentiment. Um, I was just at a wedding this weekend um, a friend of mine got married in Columbus. He's a Jewish fella um, and married another Jewish girl. I uh, went to an Indian wedding last last year, you know, 100% Indian wedding. So it's just beautiful to see cultures come together. You know, you're not being discriminatory. You know, you fall in love with who you fall in love with, I guess. But I think there is something about, you know, that, uh, that, that matrimony, you know, and staying true to your culture and building that way. Um, and I, I couldn't agree more with Lawrence there. And I think my friend group, the people I know, are on board with that. Uh, so I don't think that people want to be bachelors and live the Hugh Hefner life <laughs> as much as TV will lead you to believe. So, But, it, but it's, it's, all, it's all, you know, everyone has different timing. And uh, uh -huh. you can't rush it. You can't be thirsty. You can't be pressed because then, that's, then you fall into something that you shouldn't be in, right? And the divorce rate is higher than ever. So, right, right, right. Nice. Shout out to Black Love. <laughs> <laughs> Keandre, um, share with us a little perspectives in terms of uh, as a being young, black and male, in terms of just the whole dating and, and marriage. And, and, and you can elaborate even in the institution of family as well. Sure. So first thing I'll say is I definitely feel like the dating scene has changed dramatically compared to only even five, 10 years ago, to be quite honest, because these days, you know, and the era of instant gratification to go tie back to that point you made, you know, we have in our phones the ability to just swipe away and, you know, see people from all over the world that we could potentially date. And ultimately, I think that overload of options sometimes makes people more hesitant to really invest in others, because oftentimes if one, two issues may pop up, then people aren't willing to collaborate and communicate and actually solve those problems, which is what, even though I'm not married, I anticipate in a marriage, that's something that you're going to need to do on a regular basis. When an issue pops up, when a mutual disagreement arises, you can't simply have a mindset of, well, there's always someone else. Ultimately, you need to be investing in your partner and investing in, you know, growing together as a couple. So on that note, and also on the other note that these days, I feel like I see more and more of my friends investing in themselves and making sure that they're established and ready for partnership 
before they enter it because the last thing that you want to happen is to have two people that don't know themselves come together and you know have to work through a lot of things that could have been avoided if they had taken the time to establish themselves and learn themselves and you know rectify their past traumas their past uh hurt before entering a relationship with someone else because you want to ensure that when you are coming together that you're creating a stable foundation that allows you to have a successful family and tying it again back to early in the conversation i mean if you want to change the world as tyreek said you may not be able to change an entire community as one person but i forget who said it but if you want to change the world you start with yourself and as an extension of yourself you have your your partner and as an extension of your partner you have your family and you can most definitely change the world through the way you and your family are raised and present themselves to the world so it's all interconnected you know as i listen to you young men talk i'm thinking about uh folks that are older than me that as you were talking were probably saying talk boy talk boy you all are definitely giving truth on tonight uh dr moss uh what i'm so uh encouraged by uh from our discussion tonight is the understand, understanding that uh, these young men understand that in order uh, to to uh, have a better shot in the future, that they are they are in charge of their destiny. Um, so many times we can blame society, we can blame the fact that we grew up in a home where we didn't have two parents, where we didn't have financial resources, and uh, if that were if there were some teeth to that then there wouldn't be people who would be succeeding from various backgrounds and uh, all types of environments. Uh, what is a challenge, uh, Dr. Moss, for persons who may even be in therapy to recognize that there is the power within them? And where does the will and determination and, and how can we guide people uh, who may be considered uh, as being disadvantaged uh, to rise above what they don't have and to use what they do have to become successful. You know, you just uh, described this definition of uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, how we can persevere, you know, regardless of what our, our financial or you know, economic background may be or our psychological, you know, state of family of origin, where we came from, being able to kind of push against that. You know, one of the things that the key and what you look at that from people who have to get on and get great careers or able to make some progress with their mental health, is to think of local control. You know, so I am going to see myself as a determining factor whether I'm going to have success or not. And I can look out my window and I can see the things that work against me and what society has done, what laws have been passed, and, and all those things. I can I can focus on those. But the more that I focus on those things, though they need change, and the less, the less that I focus on what I can control, then I become a, a victim of that. Mm. If I can look at myself and say, you know, there's a part of this, though as unfair as the circumstances can be, there's a part of this that I can control and that I can determine. And that little bit, I'm going to wrap my hands around that. I can do that, then I have some degree of self determination that I can make some progress. But again, with health outcomes, with psychological, mental health, physical health, but also financial outcomes and professional outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the big difference. I think. If we can look at what we can control, what we can master, and how we can you know, just exploit and magnify that. Well, a quote that I, I use probably too much. It's a Shakespearean quote, and it's really, to thy own self be true. And basically we have to be real with ourselves. Uh, there's one other uh, conversation I want us to, to get into before we close, and I'm, I'm having, we're having a great time tonight. Uh, you all are, as, as black men, one of, the, um, one of the things we have to concern ourselves with uh, is being profiled being labeled and associated with um, those within our community who may not conduct themselves well. Uh, quite honestly, many uh, folks uh, look at us and see us as threats. They see us as dangers. They see us 
as someone who probably will may have the potential to perpetrate a crime against them. Um, uh, what does it mean for you? Uh, or what are your thoughts on what's transpired um, with all of those within your demographic who have been killed um, by the, and have suffered brutality uh, by the hand of law enforcement? Share me, share with me a little as being black, being young and a male. Share with me your views and your concerns uh, about future interactions and past interactions with law enforcement. Uh, Lawrence, start with you. Yeah, so um, I was just thinking the other day. So when I when I was 21 years old, uh, which again was <laughs> was uh 12 years ago, um, I worked at U.S. Bank, and I was the only black, uh, male or female, uh, that worked at this particular branch. So again, we're, and and going into it, I, I told myself I would never carry cash on me because I didn't want to be responsible for any cash that was missing, mm. right? And fast forward 12 years later, I still don't carry cash. Mm. It's embedded in me not to carry cash because of that that role at that at that company, you know. And it's just those are the things that again, the white people just don't have to think about <laughs> when mm -hmm. when when just trying to you know make make a career and, and, and make a living. Um, I've had experiences of profiling with with police. Um, I remember my house got broken into and uh, years ago and they made it seem like it was my fault, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, again, and I, I, even at that time, I was like, if you knew who you was talking to, you would never question uh, me like this. You know what I mean? I, I already, I know who I am and I'm, I'm comfortable in my skin. Um, but I think, you know, the seeing the deaths of our black, you know, men and women, you know, rest in peace to Sandra Bland and all of the women who have been, you know, killed. Um, Brianna Taylor. Mm -hmm. You know, Brianna Taylor. You know, the list unfortunately goes on and on. Um, it hurts. Like mm -hmm. it really hurts um, to see it. You know, you you know me being thirty three. You know, when you hear somebody die at twenty six, you I automatically go back to where was I? What what would I've not accomplished? If I died at 26, you know, now I wouldn't have had one of my daughters. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had my business. You know, it's like a lot of things would be missing in my life right now if I if I passed away that early. Um, so it gives me a set of gratitude, but I don't want my gratitude to come from black tragedy. And I'm just mm -hmm. sick of that. Mm -hmm. Um having to, I, I'm sick of having to live like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just again, so it it forces me. Um, it goes back to that privilege that Tyreek and, and Keandre and myself had talked about of being black, young black and a male. It's like it's a duty and it's an honor to, to be the light of the world, you know, in our black world. Um, when so many people don't get access to, um, you know, the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's just tough, man. So I, I just it, it, it really does. You know, it hurts to have to keep going through this every single year um, and not get, you know, again, there's no justice that truly gets served for, for our people. Tyreek, you hold a law degree uh, and uh, uh, persons who, who have certain achievements within our community are, are, are celebrated. Um, your family's proud of you. Your community is proud of you. Um, you have your hands on the steering wheel at nine and three. Uh, you're leaving work with all the confidence and assurance you have uh, as a black male. But out of nowhere, you notice in your rear view mirror that there are some blue lights flickering on top of a vehicle, which you recognize as the police. What's going through your mind at that moment 
yeah, first say a quick prayer to myself um, because it, it, you know, it's sad. You, you can be doing everything right. You can have the seatbelt on. You can have your hands 93. It could be a routine traffic stop and you could wind up dead. You know, that, that's the unfortunate reality that we have um, in 2022. Uh, as a black male, we rarely get the benefit of the doubt, if ever. So we, I think you have to know that going into that interaction. Like, hey, I'm not getting any benefit of the doubt here. None whatsoever. Um, and so having all that in, in your mind, I, I also think it's important to know your rights. Uh, and, and if you can have your license registration ready, have that ready. Again, um, be polite, be respectful, be courteous, and and try to make that interaction go as smooth as possible. All right. Keandre, um, you're walking down the street and there's been a robbery and the police are searching uh, for suspect, but they say you match uh, that description um, of the suspect. Uh, how do you respond, Keandre? That's a good question, uh, Pastor Phillips. To be honest, internally, I would respond with frustration, admittedly, just because still to this day, I have to be mindful of the fact that no matter what I do or achieve or represent, that ultimately, when it comes to law enforcement, that they will see me through a different lens than I see myself, that my friends see myself, that my family sees myself. And being mindful of that, kind of similar to what Tyreek said, I just have to unfortunately ensure that I comply without putting myself in danger while being mindful again of and any other interaction that I have with law enforcement that I and I and it, I struggle to articulate my words right now because the situation in itself, imagine myself in it is a frustrating thing to imagine. And I've been in situations where I've been racially profiled during a routine traffic stop where it comes down to only one, really one car being necessary and uh, additional three, four cars coming up and end up searching my car when I'm coming back from a late night study session as opposed to anything else that they may have imagined me to be doing. So the rally of America today as a young black man is that unfortunately we've been killed during the most mundane of situations. And because of that, we have to be hyper aware, hyper vigilant of what may play out even when we are quote unquote following the rules following the playbook so yeah i'll put in a plug there just to say if if you can't take a know your rights sort of class do that you know because you do have rights you do have rights right you, you said you had your car search you know there are certain legal procedural things that have to be done the right way in every situation so you have rights so if anybody can take a know your rights course do that mm -hmm. appreciate the plug Tyree. Dr. Moss, uh, uh, all of the ill things we hear about uh, young black males, there's so much negative information out there today, but I do believe there's something uh, positive going on as well. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. I'm, in, I'm encouraged, man. I wish I could take a picture of this screen and I could take it to a couple places, man, because it's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, I want people to understand that this isn't this isn't the exception. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of us who uh, who love our communities, who contribute to our communities, and you know, and we're doing well. And I want this to be um, the norm, mm -hmm. and what people envision to be the exception. Wow! Because this is you know what we see here. This is a, this is happening. It's happening, you know, um, you know, all over the country, and uh, I'm hoping that the country starts to take more notice. Thank you. Uh, in closing, we're going to go around the horn tonight. We'll we'll go with uh, Lawrence. We'll go to Keandre, and we'll go with Tyreek. Um, in a sense, I believe that we are our brother's keeper. There are some folks that you may know that perhaps have not uh, be, have been able to display the best version of themselves uh in 15 seconds or less lawrence what encouraging word would you do to the uh brothers that you know that may not uh be living up the best living up to their potential 
Simply put, man, I would say judge each day not by its harvest, but by the seed you sow into it. Right, Tariq? It's a Michael Jordan quote. Some people want it to happen. Some people hope that it happens. And some people make it happen. That, that's what I would say. It's motivating me throughout undergrad, throughout law school. And I will tell anybody that make it happen. All right. Keandre? Everything's interconnected. Your thoughts flow into your words, which flow into your actions, which flow into your habits, which becomes your destiny. So being mindful of that, be conscious of your thought patterns. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Dr. Moss and I, thank you so much for I, I'm, I feel like a proud father. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I say I'm black and I'm proud. I should break out some James Brown and I, I'm some James Brown. And I should just be breaking it down because really uh, I feel black and proud tonight. And I'm, I'm thankful um, that though some people may look uh, at a, the demographic of, of being young, being black and, and a male uh, as something negative. But you all have represented that really uh, and conveyed uh, in a very articulate manner that being uh, young, black, and male is, is something not to be ashamed of, but it's something to be proud of and to count uh, yourselves among the blessed. To our viewers tonight, both tonight and those that will be watching uh, after the original or airing of this show, we want to leave you, uh, as always, encouraging you to feel better, uh, to become better and to live better. On behalf of myself and Dr. Moss, thank you for joining us tonight. And we look forward to you being with us again next week.